Hi everyone and welcome to McLean Racing. Today's video is all about brake bias. It's going to be a quick tutorial followed by a simple experiment that I highly suggest you replicate on your sim. Brake bias is a standard setting on most modern race cars and can be controlled in car mid-race. Changing the bias will have a dramatic effect on how the car handles in the braking and turning phases of any corner. Knowing how to tune it to your driving style and your car will give you an advantage over the next driver who does not. This is especially true in a fixed car series like the BMW 12.0 where brake bias is one of the very few adjustments that you can make. So what is brake bias? Simply put, it is the distribution of total braking force between the front and rear wheels of the car. It is measured as a percent of total braking force that's sent to the front wheels of the car. So for example, a brake bias of 60 will send 60% of the total braking force to the front wheels and the remaining 40% to the rear. A brake bias of 50 will send an equal distribution of braking force to the front and the rear of the car. And that's it. So the question now is what setting should I use? use. I have three general rules of thumb that I follow when I'm setting my brake bias. The first is to minimize the braking distance. To do this, the front and the rear tires should lock up under heavy load at the same time. This will ensure that we are maximizing the total available grip on all four tires during braking. Now the second and third rules are related, but opposite. Increasing the bias setting will also increase understeer. That's because the front tires will lock up slightly before the rear tires and that will under rotate the car. Subsequently, decreasing the bias will increase oversteer. And that's because the rear tires are locking up slightly before the front, which will help rotate the car under braking. To get the setting that's right for you, you must first get it in the ballpark. Do this by going fast in a straight line on even ground and press the brakes until you lock up. If the fronts are locking up first, then decrease the setting. If the rear's locking up, then increase the setting. Once the front and the rears are locking up at about the same time, we can move on to fine tuning the setting. We do this by hot lapping. If you find you're having trouble turning in the car during a corner, try decreasing the setting a little bit. And if you find your car is too loose on turn in, increase the setting. Generally speaking, a slightly higher setting is a safer setting for a long race. This is because inducing understeer will typically result in running wide in a corner and it's not nearly as catastrophic as inducing oversteer and spinning out. Now to get the absolute most out of your car, you can change your settings as the tires warm up or if the track conditions change or even multiple times during the same lap. If you happen to catch Lando Norris's stream of the IndyCar iRacing Challenge of week five at the Circuit of the Americas, you would have noticed his engineer doing exactly that. At the beginning of the stint, he lowered the brake bias to 55.9 for the slow technical corners 13 through 16, and then raised it up to 56.5 until turn 13 the following lap. As the tires warmed up, he lowered it to 55.9 for turns three through nine as well. If you want to check it out, I left a link in the description below. The race starts at the one hour 44 minute mark and the brake bias setting is on the screen for the entire race. So let's jump into the sim in the BMW M8 GTE at Sebring. We'll change the settings to the extreme, both high and low, bring it in a bit, and then finally set it at 50 to see how the car reacts. After we do our experiment, I will find the brake bias setting that's right for me using the procedure I described before. Then I'll do some laps, see what my average is, and compare that to the stock BMW brake bias setting to see if we can save some time. Let's go. All right, so we're in our sim. We're gonna start uh, screwing around with the brake bias pressure. As you can see in the bottom right, the default is 56.9. So we're going to just turn that down all the way to its lowest setting, 39%. And we're just gonna give this whirl See how far we can get. I'm going to assume not far at all. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, if I were to stick with the setting, and I wouldn't, my braking points need to be further back because I'm not maximizing the front and the rear as much as I should. The back is going to be locking up much sooner than the front. So obviously, a bias setting of 39% is not going to cut it. So let's go the other direction and go from the lowest setting to the highest setting. We're now at 76%, and we're going to give this a whirl. Let's see how far we make it this time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Let me bring up how little I was actually hitting the brakes there. Let, give me a moment. <laughs> All right, that's worse. Somehow that that is worse. <laughs> Okay, so now we're at 44.4, which is about the midpoint between 39 and 50. And we're gonna give this a whirl. <laughs> okay, that, that's what I expected. My rear end is stepping out far too soon, but we are getting a lot more traction through there than our first, our first time around. All right, let's continue on. See, see about the next corner. I don't know if you saw right there, but my car was almost swimming down to the the corner on braking. Well, it's an improvement, obviously. Um, I didn't end up in a wall, but that's about all I can say about that. Let's bring it back up past 50% and uh, see where we land. All right, let's try it again. This time at 63% which is halfway between 50 and the maximum of 76. All right, so we're running into that problem where I'm locking up on my front and I'm not able to get all of that brake pressure I'm used to into the car to slow it down in the same distance. Let's keep it going. Yeah, so as soon as I get close to that threshold, I'm skating out a little bit more. Now let's turn it down to 50 and see how well we do then. Still a bit oversteery. But as you can see from the relative, it's much, much quicker than the other four. The threshold braking is right where I'm used to. And we got a little loose there, but obviously this is the best of the four so far. Okay, so what did we learn? Well, going all the way low, we'll lock up the rear and you'll spin almost immediately. When we go all the way up, then we will lock up the front and just go straight. Whichever direction we're heading, we're not going to stop. Even when we come off the brake almost all the way, we're still locked up in that front. Going back down to between 50% and the lowest setting, we had a very tail happy car where it was almost swimming down to that corner under braking and going the opposite way halfway between 50% and the highest setting it was much more controllable it was much more stable when it was locking up you could hear it and anticipate it and sort of get out of it without too much drama at 50% we're finding that balance that I'm looking for where I felt one corner where it was locking up in the front and I was sliding forward under steering and a different corner we had a a tail happy car that spun out. So it's somewhere around 50% where we need to be. Now let's find out by a setting that's right for us. Now if you remember our procedure from earlier, you'll remember that the first thing we got to do is go in a straight line, lock up, and see which tires lock up first. So let's keep it at this 50% and uh, just go along this front straight here and press the brakes before we hit the wall and we'll keep doing that until we adjust it just right. All right, so at 50%, the rears are locking up before the front. Let's uh, adjust that. We're gonna turn the brake pressure up to 52. Give it a whirl one more time. Yeah, it's still the rears first. 
but it was just it was just before the front like when I was feeling it, it was almost at the same time. It was just a little bit more pressure until those front locked up as well. So let's change this up to 53. Give it one more go at it. Hmm. Yeah, it's still definitely the rear, but that one seems further away. Let's bring it up to 55%. Ooh, that was close. Ooh, no, it was the front that time. But that's bit, that's right, almost right at the same time. So let's dial it back just slightly. So that was at 55 before. Okay, so we are in the ballpark now. Uh, both the front and the rears are locking up at about the same time. So now what we need to do is fine tune for this track. So I'm gonna drive around. I'm going to see what I need out of the car. If I turn in and I can't get the grip I need in the front end, I will drop the bias. So I lock up the back slightly more during turn in to get it to rotate a little bit more. Uh, the opposite true as well. So if I'm going into a corner and the back end is stepping out too much, I'm going to increase that bias and get it so I have a nice balance for all the corners on the track. This is going to take a little bit, so I'm probably going to uh, come back to you once I have it set. So 52% is where I dialed it into. Now we started all the way up here at 54.9 and I dialed it down a little bit and I was able to get a little bit more control in the turn in. I turned it down some more and I felt the same way. Went all the way down to I think 51.4 and that's when it became a little bit too uncontrolling. Uh, the tail was stepping out a little bit too much and I was finding myself counter steering in order to go straight, which means I'm losing time. So then I bumped it back up slowly and I ended around 52.1 or 52.4. Now this type of adjustment I will refine as I drive and I will dial it in a little bit more but I think now is a good time to jump to our final experiment of the day and that's comparing our tune setting to the stock setting. I'm going to do 10 laps and get our five best times with our tune settings and then do the five best times with our stock setting and I'll compare the two and see if we found any time just by tuning this into our liking. Okay, here are the results. I'll note that I did my stint on the low bias setting first, so any benefit from a learning curve would favor the default setting. First off, the fastest lap is awarded to the standard setting at a 158.65, while I was only able to get a 158.72 with the lower bias setting. But this is the least important number we'll go over, and the 7 hundredths of a second difference can be easily explained away with the learning curve. More important is the average and standard deviation of the stints. The tune bias setting saw, on average, 15 hundredths of a second improvement over the stock using the fastest five times, but increases to almost a quarter of a second improvement over the stock setting if we disregard the fastest and slowest laps and just calculate using the middle five of both stints. And the most important figure we'll look at is the standard deviation, which will measure the consistency of the laps. For those of you who don't know, standard deviation measures how close to the average any given lap will come. 68% of the time, I will get within one standard deviation above or below the average, so the lower standard deviation, the better. With the default setting, the standard deviation is 42 hundredths of a second using the fastest five laps, which means that on any given lap, my time could fluctuate between 158.75 and 159.58, almost a full second difference. With the tuned bias setting, the standard deviation drop to only 20 hundredths, which is a 100% improvement in consistency over the default. On any given lap, my time could fluctuate between 158.81 and 159.22. 
compared to the default. I'm slower by six hundredths of a second on my quickest laps, but my slowest laps will be over a third of a second faster. The benefit of this tuning is clear. The car is more consistent and the car will be faster. Before I close out this video, I wanted to share a couple interesting things I found in both stints. First is about the hairpin. Just for fun, I switched back to the tune bias setting at the tail end of the default stint and took that corner as I did before, and this happened. Sector one time is good. At first, I was concerned that the default setting wouldn't give me the grip I needed to turn in, but I was wrong. The bigger limitation for this corner is the braking distance. I was able to get on the brakes later with the default setting because the setting is closer to the 55% mark where both the front and the rear tires locked up at the same time. Using the default setting got me through this corner consistently faster. The other interesting thing I noticed was on the faster corners of Turn 1, Le Mans, and Sunset Bend. These corners were especially prone to an early lockup of the front tires when using the default setting and easily lost the most amount of time when I drifted wide at the apex. This is the main reason why the tuned bias setting was quicker on average. I could consistently hit the apex at those corners. So I think if I did it again, I would raise the bias to around 53 for this track. The hairpin is one of the best places to pass and easiest places to get past, so giving up braking distance there would result in a place or two lost in the race. A bias of 53 isn't high enough to induce an early understeer in the fast corners either. I think 53 is the best compromise. Just for fun, I try mapping the increase and decrease bias buttons to my wheel and adjust the bias to 54 or 55 after turn 5 before the hairpin, then turn it back down to 53 before Cunningham a couple turns later. This would be the best of both worlds, but I'll save that test for you to try on your own. So start your sim and give this a whirl. Learning how to tune your bias will improve your lap times and give you a major advantage over those drivers who stick to the default, especially in a fixed series like the BMW 12.0. If you enjoyed this content, please hit the like button and subscribe. If you have any suggestions for future videos, or questions about brake bias, please leave them in the comments below. Until next time, cheers.